Hi, I'm Becky Brune and welcome to my vlog. Watch an adaptation of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice and you will notice that a screenwriter can just pluck uh, speeches and whole scenes out of a 200 year old novel and pop them on the screen and they work. Don't keep on coughing, Kitty, good heavens! Have a little compassion on my poor nerves! He's just what a young man ought to be, Lizzie. Sensible, lively, and I never saw such happy manners. Oh, you excel so much in the dance, Mr. Lyson, that Mr. Darcy, who in general dislikes the amusement, wishes to oblige. Mr. Darcy is all politeness. It gives the impression that adapting Jane Austen and Pride and Prejudice is easy, um, but that can't be true. There are adaptations that do it well and adaptations that do it poorly. There are obviously pitfalls. So what are they? Uh, and why are some adaptations so much better than others? If you would rather talk about the glories than the pitfalls, um, look for my next Pride and Prejudice video. This one is about the pitfalls. At its core, Pride and Prejudice is about a prideful young man and a young woman who is biased against him and how they both learn about each other and themselves and grow up. There's obviously a lot more going on than that. There are side stories and uh, love stories, but if you read it with the core in mind, everything feeds back to those two people and to that premise. And that efficiency is, what, is one of the reasons why this novel is considered one of the greatest novels ever written. Let's look at four straight adaptations of Pride and Prejudice and see how they adapted it and what pits they might have fallen into. The first line of Pride and Prejudice is legendary. It is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. This truth is so well fixed in the minds of the surrounding families that he is considered as the rightful property of some one or other of their daughters. In these first lines, Jane Austen is painting the whole landscape for us. She's looking down in her little mouse maze and she's saying, this is the social system that pits our hero against our heroine, pride versus prejudice, and we're going to explore it and poke a little fun at it. In the Colin Firth version, they want those lines on the screen, uh, but they don't have a narrator, um, so they give them to Elizabeth. Or a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. <laughs> yes, he must indeed! She's making fun of her mother here and of her mother's eagerness to claim Bingley, but if you think about it, it doesn't really make sense for Elizabeth to say that line. She is a 20 year old girl who is in the mouse maze. She is part of the social machinery. Is Elizabeth above her world? No, she isn't. None of them are. They are all caught in the machinery. And Elizabeth is the prejudice in Pride and Prejudice. How do other adaptations deal with that opening? The Keira Knightley version skips it. The version opens with her walking through that amazing pastoral landscape alone, reading. And it's the first clue that we get that the filmmakers are going to be creating a darker, moodier film through cinematography, which they do. In the 1940 version with Greer Garson and Laurence Olivier, they do something very different with it. Um, they basically act it out. The Bennett sisters are all in uh, a dressmaking shop looking at fabric. Outside, a carriage comes by uh, with, with the new tenants of Netherfield. They quickly assess that they are wealthy, single young men, and they end up racing each other, Bennett's versus Lucas's, back home to see who can be the first <laughs> to introduce themselves to him. It plays like the chariot race in Ben-Hur, and it gives us the idea that it's gonna be broad humor. Pratt Falls, a neighborhood competition, no one is seriously gonna get injured. I admire this version for being a true cinematic representation of the premise of Pride and Prejudice. The 1980 BBC teleplay is another longer version, um, five episodes, 50 minutes each, and they also give the lines to Elizabeth. Actually, Elizabeth and Charlotte share the lines. Wonder. A single man in possession of a good fortune coming to live at Netherfield. <laughs> it is a truth universally acknowledged that such a man must be in want of a wife. Of course. He has the rightful property of one or other of the neighborhood daughters. If it doesn't make sense for Elizabeth to say those lines, it really doesn't make sense for Elizabeth and Charlotte to be tossing those lines back and forth. It is one of the many times that this particular screenwriter 
doesn't seem to care who says which line. In fact, I was tempted to fill this video with just horrifying examples from the 1980 version, but I'm going to give you just two. In the novel, the least developed Bennett sisters are Mary and Kitty. Jane Austen paints them both very quickly and then she allows them to play their part in moving the plot forward. But in the 1980 version, the screenwriter decides to beef up their, their characters. Kitty is actually physically larger than Lydia and sort of dominates physically and gets a bunch of Lydia's lines. And Mary is still a bookworm, but she's also a gossip. Uh, and it actually opens with her running out to the street to get intelligence about who it is who has rented Netherfield Park. Based on the time it was written and the biography of the screenwriter, I'm guessing that she wanted to make up for some underappreciated women in the story, uh, but I don't know. The second example is after the ball at Meryton, Bingley is singing the praises of Jane, and his sisters agree that they'd like to get to know her better, and in the novel, Jane Austen writes, Miss Jane Bennett was therefore established as a sweet girl, and their brother felt authorized by such commendation to think of her as he chose. It's a clever way of showing that his sisters might have had some influence over who Bingley was allowed to fall in love with. But in the 1980 version, the screenwriter has a really crabby Darcy give Bingley permission. Bingley, you may think of her as you choose. And then he adds this. But not allowed. And again, I think that the screenwriter is removing the, the complexity of that relationship and instead just turning uh, Darcy into a bully. For someone familiar with Pride and Prejudice, the 1980 version is pretty painful. <laughs> I watched it so you don't have to, unless you want to, and then you can join my support group. A question that comes up in every adaptation is, how does Darcy go from this to this and then to this? In the novel, Jane Austen explains it. But filmmakers have a problem because Darcy never speaks about it to anybody. Um, not to Bingley, not to Bingley's sisters, obviously, not to Colonel Fitzwilliam. He's ashamed of his weakness. Mortified is the word that Jane Austen uses. So they have to show us his changing feelings without dialogue, which is a tall order for an actor. Colin Firth is an expressive actor, and I think he does uh, convey his change of heart at the Meryton Ball, when she stays at Netherfield, and then at Rosings before he proposes. But really, we have to wait until the end for him to explain his arc to her and to us. In the 1980 version, okay, I can't, I gotta, I can't. In the 1980 version, uh, filmmakers and the actor ha have a very difficult time conveying this. H his voice is remarkably similar to Colin Firth's. I might perhaps wish to be informed why, with so little endeavor at civility, I am thus rejected. Um, but he's very stiff. I think they told him to look haughty and superior, and that's what he did. So Darcy's change of heart is pretty mysterious in the 1980 version. In the Keira Knightley version, we again have a, a superior actor, um, but not as much time to do it. It's only two hours compared to the six hour ones. Um, so what they did was they softened him immediately. He is already attracted to her when they first see each other. She asks if he dances and he snaps back, but he seems uncomfortable. And unlike the novel, he doesn't know how close she is when he insults her we see his internal conflict. He ends up being the most vulnerable Darcy, the most in, obviously in love with her during the proposal scene, which is not exactly true to the book, but I think it does it's a really good job of conveying who they are. It sets each of them off to continue their evolution <laughs> and to understand their own weaknesses. Um, it, it's a pretty stunning scene. Greer Garson and Laurence Olivier, what they do is terrible. Part of the problem is that the filmmakers, to shorten things up, um, compress all of the, the Meriton Assembly, the Lucas Card Party, and the Netherfield Ball into one dance. Meeting Wickham, Bingley meeting uh, Jane, Lizzie hearing the insult, 
Darcy begging uh, Sir William to introduce him to Lizzie. Lizzie refusing to dance with uh, Mr. Darcy. It's all jammed into one event. So Darcy's change seems lightning fast. I mean, it borders on mental illness. The screenwriter tried to allow for this by making the insult to Elizabeth less personal. Yeah, she looks tolerable enough, but I'm in no humor tonight to give consequence to the middle classes at play. But it makes Darcy seem pedantic and unlikable rather than just aloof. They made a lot of changes in this version in order to fit it into the two hours, but also uh, to reflect the times, 1940, wartime, uh, emphasis on family and home. Um, some of the changes work, these didn't. Internal pivots like Darcy's are one of Jane Austen's specialties. She loves going in, inside somebody and letting them go through a process of self-discovery or of self-delusion, so there's a lot of them. For instance, how quickly Mr. Collins ends up proposing to Charlotte. Hilariously in the book, by the way. How Elizabeth can seemingly not know that Darcy is in love with her. Why Miss Bingley goes on at Darcy for so long until he finally slaps back very hard. These are all understood in the book, but not always explained well on the screen, and they end up raising questions. The last pitfall, and then we can all go watch our own favorite <laughs> adaptation. Casting. Elizabeth is 20 years old, um, the equivalent of two years out of high school. Kira Knightley was the closest to the right age. In fact, aside from Donald Sutherland, that cast was all closest to the correct age. And it really helps us to see a near 20-year-old cast in that role. Elizabeth is so precocious and articulate and self-assured. In my word, you give your opinion very decidedly for so young a person. That if you cast someone much older, we forget that she is young and fallible. Her youth explains why she initially adores her father without criticism, why she falls so fast for Wickham, why she is so quick to think the worst of Darcy. On the other end of things, Greer Garson was 36 years old, and she presents as a full-on adult on the screen. But Charlotte, this is my house, and you'll do just as I say. I tremble and obey. Greer Garson had been a stage actress, and so there's a lot of flinging her eyes about. But having her play a 20-year-old undermines the story and I think ruins it. And it's not just Elizabeth who should be cast age appropriately. Um, in the Colin Firth version, they cast Julia Sawala as Lydia, and I know why they did it. She is so great, and she really, she has that just crazy out there performance that really lets you see how off the rails Lydia was. But Lydia was 15. She is full young to be out much in company. And Julia was 27. So we end up minimizing her vulnerability. Wickham is not just selfish and impulsive as Lydia is. He's cruel and predatorial. It was okay at the time for a 15 year old to get married, but if Darcy had not interfered, she was not going to get married. Uh, she would most likely have been dumped in London and had become a prostitute. Um, Jane Austen actually says that in the book. It's important that we see that she is 15. And then how old is Mr. Bennett supposed to be? His oldest daughter is 23, so Mrs. Bennett is probably 40 or 42, so maybe he's 50. He is a dad who is ashamed that he has not provided better for his family. But when you cast Donald Sutherland, who is 70, uh, as the father, you sort of transform him into a doddering old grandfather figure instead. We feel kind of sorry for him having to deal with all of those women. <laughs> and we end up not seeing how much of this whole situation is his fault. If the actress playing Mary Bennett is beautiful, but they just pop some glasses on her, or if the actress playing Charlotte is beautiful, it, it takes away from the story. If Miss Darcy is too boisterous, it makes us question Darcy's protectiveness of her. If Mr. Collins is too conventional looking, it makes the Bennett sisters seem cruel. And if Miss Bingley is not exceptionally chic, it takes away the counterpoint to Elizabeth Bennett. We know casting is a tough decision for filmmakers and we do give them some leeway, but when they go too far away from the character's 
described traits, um, it changes the story. If you haven't already read the book, I encourage you to. If you've had trouble with it, um, try the Audible version. It's amazing how much more you will understand the characters and the place when Jane Austen is your guide. Take care and see you next time. A collection of people in whom there is little beauty and no fashion. I do not feel the slightest interest in any of them and fail to see how you can possibly do so.